A very good afternoon and welcome to this session about piracy. The pirates are coming. Are they going to steal all your stuff and steal your industry and what you all make? Or does it present its own new opportunities? This is what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. And we're very lucky to have such a great panel with us. On my far right, Adam Curtis, of course, filmmaker. Many of you will be familiar with his work. Rick Faltfinger from the Pirate Party, who title will suggest is one of the most keen proponents of the fact that piracy could change our lives to the better. On my immediate left we've got Mark Lawrence from Endemol and my far left John McVeigh from PAX, the Producers Alliance for Cinema and Television. One little tiny bit of housekeeping if you want to tweet, we're trying to get people's views in and then I can bring them into the discussion before your question and answers towards the end of the panel. The hashtag for this room is Murfoot, which is the name of the room, not some cryptic code for something else. So in a moment we'll get the discussion going with the panel but first of all we're going to have a little look at just exactly how controversial this issue has become. Not necessarily in this country yet but let's have a taste of what might face us in the future. A taster there of what might happen here. Remarkable to think the pirates have already beaten the American president. Quite a thought. First of all to Rick Falt um, Faltfinger. You obviously are a huge supporter of all this stuff. It should be a complete free-for-all. But it, fundamentally, it's theft, isn't it? No, it's not. I mean, theft, by definition, is that when you take somebody from somebody else with the intent of denying them the use of it. Copying is not stealing. It's not stealing philosophically, economically, morally, or, or legally. It, neither, is ar neither, neither is it arson, kidnapping, or anything, anything else. I mean, framing it as theft, is more PR than anything else. It is a way to use language to frame the debate as you being the good guy. But it's not, it's copying. And that's perhaps one of the most important things. We call it culture sharing, which is our way of framing ourselves as the good guys. Sharing knowledge and culture, which is what humanity has always done. John McVeigh. Uh, <clears throat> I don't problem with copying. I think, I think uh, our television industry, in one sense, is derived from adapting influences, creating new works based on the influences that we have. <clears throat> uh, so I don't have a problem with people copying, uh, provided they've got the permission of the person who owns the copyright. Um, so I, I think that's a bit of a disingenuous comment. Uh, if I've given you the right to copy something, and you want to copy it, then that's perfectly fine. If I don't want you to copy it, and you take it anyway, I think that's something entirely different. So what is it then? Is piracy theft? Would you use that? Is it stealing? If, you don't if it's have denying me, if I would rather you bought the work, you bought whatever it is I want to sell you, but you take it anyway, you're denying me a revenue stream, so I'm denied that income. So, so you're not taking the money out of my pocket literally, but you're denying me that revenue. So I do have a problem with that because that, those revenues, the £600 million that came up at the end of that screen there, that £600 million, which we don't get back into the economy, which pays for all the people who work in our industry in this room, uh, is jobs, is money to authors, is money to actors, is money to directors, is money to producers, is deficit finance. All of those things sustain a vibrant and one of the world's most successful TV economies. So, so if, you just take, if I want to sell it to you and you take it anyway, I've got a problem. As a copyright owner... I can give my stuff away if I choose to do so. And in fact, uh, Lawrence Lessig, the famous uh, copyright lawyer from America, invented a, a copyright contract called the Creative Commons, which I can use as a copyright owner to give away anything I want. But as a copyright owner, as the creator of the work, I have a choice what I want to do with what I create. I, I shouldn't have people deciding what they want to do with what I've created. Why do people pirate, Rick? Because they can get it somewhere else. They just, they're just doing it if they don't want to pay. Surely that is basically taking something that's not yours. Let me ask a question. How many in here have some have uh, downloaded a TV show? Just okay. Just to get a feel. Clear majority. Just to get a feel for how many know how to do it. So, for those of you who haven't, it's very very easy. You basically just go to a website like easyrss.it, type the name of a show you'd like to watch, and then you click one button giving you a subscription to this show. And after that, every new episode of this show will show up on your desktop as a file. You can, show, you can view it on your iPad, you can view it on your phone, you can view it wherever you move this file. It's very, very convenient. What you have to beat is this convenience. You, if 
Game of Thrones was being broadcast simultaneously across the world, this would not happen. But Mark, isn't that the point then, actually? And Game of Thrones is the most downloaded programme last year. Nearly four million people downloaded it, which is not far off the same number of people who were actually watching it traditionally. I mean, actually, isn't it then <laughs> up to people in the industry to make it easier for fans to consume stuff? Well, it, well it is and it isn't. I mean, what you're doing is you're taking away the broadcasters or the channels' uh, right to schedule it when they like. Um, now, you know, when you're transmitting something in the States, it's very convenient to say, OK, let's, let's roll it out immediately the next day within 24 hours. Well, for Australia uh, and English-speaking nations, that's fine. But the Italians and the Spanish and the people in East and Central Europe and Hungary, they don't have that choice. They'd rather wait and have it languaged uh, so they can watch it and enjoy it to its full. Do you, so. don't, don't you think that's going to change over time? I mean, people want stuff when they want it. And for how long will channels and broadcasters had City have, as you said, the right to decide when to give it to people. But, I, but it, it goes back to fundamental. Why can't we decide? Why have we got to be forced into a corner to, to, to transmit it early? And, and, and it's a great example. In, in, in the States, with, with the mid-seasons, they come out and they'll be available in the UK or Northern Hemisphere right in the middle of the summer. And commercially, we don't want to play it in the summer because there's less people around, there's less advertising money, and we want to play it in September when there's more people available to view. So why should we have to play it in the middle of August? Or why should we play it in Italy when Italy's empty and they've all gone to the beaches as they have in, 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 in France and all the Norwegians have gone to their lake houses? We shouldn't have to choose. But if you're, that's when your customers want it? Isn't that your but job? I don't think it is when our customers want it because if it wasn't, if it wasn't illegally downloaded and ava made available, in, 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 then our customers could watch it in September when it's all been fully translated and, and customised for their territory uh, and they're allowed to do it. But we're being forced not to do it. Uh, I, I, I think convenience is just spurious nonsense, to be quite honest. Uh, we live in the UK. The UK was the first country in Europe, the first TV territory in Europe, to launch full VOD services from PSBs, which are free. The UK, we give away our TV content free, thousands of hours a year free, which you can catch up on multiple VOD players. The iPlayer is this, has a billion views per year now. So the idea that we somehow have to go to a URL, which is a pirate link, uh, in order to get convenience, I just, th I just think it's nonsense. It's usually legitimate services, which one, aren't taking money or trying to take money off you for maybe other dodgy deals, or two, might have uh, issues which might have in impact on your, the operation of your PC. Use proper legitimate services. It's all there for you. It's all fine. But if I sell my program to France Telecom, uh, and they've given me an X amount of money, which I've put into financing the program in the UK, France Telecom has a right to choose when they want to release that in France and how they release it in France through their broadcasting and their VOD service. That's, that's how the system works. That is a, a sequencing of rights. Just because someone in France wants to get it earlier, uh, if they get it earlier, that could diminish the money that France wants to pay to me to invest in, in my programme. That, Adam, that, someone... that, that, uh, that fundamentally attacks our ability to invest in our creativity because these people don't pay you anything. You don't get any money from pirate people. Uh, VPN sites, which have just been closed down on one guy prosecuted recently, the subscription that he was charging monthly users, none of that came to the creators or rights owners, not one single penny. So if you care about the creative industries, creative industries need money to pay you, to pay everyone else to work in it, to survive, to pay Adam to make the, sh the programs that drive our industry. So, so if these people want to set up legitimate services, which they can license rights from and pay me as a creator, that's fine. Turn, you know, you know, turn turn Pirate Bay into a legitimate commercial service. Come and license the rights from rights owners. I don't have a problem with that. I don't care what it's called or where it operates. But you need to pay the rights owners and the creators for the work that they've they've got investment in. Right. First of all, I think the discussion is starting to frame about a right, and I'd be very careful about doing doing so. We're talking about something that 250 million Europeans do, and social values are not in connection with the laws as they are written. 250 million Europeans who do things against the law are not a teenager problem any longer. They are a power base of 250 million voters that will kick 
politicians who demonize them out of office well, and, and have already started doing and we, so. And we saw the that. next generation will rewrite the laws and the rules and we saw to that their values. Our, we saw that in our clip there. There have been huge backlashes when politicians have tried to legislate on this and failed to do so. But can you address, though, that fundamental point? If piracy grows and grows and grows, the business model for these guys gets broken and then there won't be anything online to be consumed. Okay, okay. three points. First, the people who pirate tend to spend more on culture. That has been proven again and again and again in, at university studies, mostly because they're fans of culture. Second, yes, distribution models will be broken. You can no longer charge for moving bits from point A to point B because as an economy, we pay people to do things we can't do ourselves. Everybody can move bits from point A to point B today, so you can't charge for that any longer. That has no value. You need to charge for something else. Essentially, if, you're, if you have a distribution network, that is a sunk cost. The internet is going to just disintegrate it. And third, most importantly, it is not, we see that culture expenditures from household has remained constant since the advent of file sharing, since the advent of large scale file sharing, since Napster. People are spending as much on culture as they, all, as they always have, but it is not going as much to the middlemen as it used to. And that's excellent for artists because they're getting much more of the pie. We have hard numbers to show this. Well, let's talk to one of those artists and creators because it certainly can cost a lot to make the kind of content of the quality that someone like Adam Curtis makes. Compared to the others on the panel, I think you have a relatively open mind. But to, to start <laughs> us off, as somebody who makes content that millions of people want to consume, do you mind how they get it? Do you mind if they get it off some obscure website in the middle of the night? Uh, what I think about this subject is that it's one of those ones that you genuinely can see both sides of the argument. I mean, I genuinely can, and I can't... I mean, on the one hand, I, I completely agree. I think the idea of the, that the internet has brought a, a greater openness and a sharing of information is, and it av avoids elite filters is, is an extremely good idea and is wonderful. Um, I also like the fact that it annoys schedulers um, uh, <laughs> and, and gets people to talk about rights very upset. It's good fun. Um, on the other hand, though, uh, I see the argument. You know, you are taking money away from uh, people who s have slaved. I mean, I'm all right. I work in the BBC and we're publicly funded, but, but, but who work hard um, and don't see the value of their thing given to them. Uh, it, it genuinely is, I mean, I can see both sides of the argument. What I think when you get one of those situations, that you can see both sides of the argument, it means there's something else sitting there. Uh, and I think there are two things sitting here which are really much more fundamental. One is that the, you, what we're, both sides would agree on is the ubiquity, that, that, that stuff is everywhere now. It's just everywhere. And it's pictures, images, videos, music, everything is everywhere. And when that happens in a society, that becomes devalued. It begins to lose its specialness, its mystique. I mean, value is much more than just what simple capitalist marketeers tell you. It's, it's born out of a sort of cultural sense of what a thing is and what its relationship between those who make it and those who consume it is. It's, if it's special, it has a very, very high value. If it's everywhere, like you can just, uh, you know, you can go onto any of these sites, it loses something. And what I think is actually happening here, and, and this argument is in a way a sort of, a sort of like that thing, uh, is that, is that it, what we thought was special isn't special any longer. And there may be other things waiting out in the wings which will become special and which can be, if you want to be a capitalist, monetized and, and made special. But if you want to be a pretentious creative, you can get mystique out of it. But, uh, but it's something to do with the fact that I think the internet is far more conservative a, a system than we have realized. It, it actually tries to hold things. It's an engineering system, so it tends to have a sort of engineering idea behind it. And engineers just want to create systems that hold things stable. What both sides here are talking about is how to keep things stable at the moment, how to distribute things, what's the right way of doing it. They're not talking about what you can make in the future, how you can make better things. That's because, in a way, these things that we make now have lost that big mystique that they used to have. In many ways, that's good, because the, the idea of the elite giving you something has gone. But it means that they're just sort of nothing now. 
I mean, there are lots of good bits of music being made at the moment, and there are te good television programmes being made, but there is a sense of stuckness in our culture, and I think it's sort of related to this. I'm sorry, I'm trying to kick it into a bigger area, but I, yeah, I, I do yeah. think yeah. When, you, when you can see both sides of an argument, there's something else there. Well, and indeed, isn't it, Joe, John, wouldn't it be better, actually, if organisations like yours and other people in the industry took a much more forward-looking stance, looking for that next thing? Uh, there's a, a point I was just going to make. No, no, okay, right. But uh, isn't there a threat that you guys, in a sense, are a bit like King and you? No, 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 you know, no right, okay, no, no, I knew you were going to come here. Uh, <coughs> um, uh, if you spoke to Emma Woodward, my PA, uh, she gets very annoyed with me because my diary gets filled up with uh, what I call Beatles meetings because I meet with lots of new tech startups, uh, video companies, VOD companies, IPTV, a whole range of them, in fact. Blinkbox, Hulu, we started working with Hulu four years ago. Um, <coughs> and she gets really annoyed because she goes, who are all these strange people you're meeting? Well, for me, it's the Beatles meeting because I never know the next person walking the door is Mark Zuckerberg or not. Uh, and therefore, I would be mad not to embrace innovation, particularly for independent producers. So I take all the meetings. Uh, if someone calls me up, they say, we want to come and pitch this new idea. It's a new aggregation service. It's a multi-platform, two-screen content service. I take all those meetings because we are interested in innovation. I'm interested in Adam's point about the bit that's missing, the new, the new paradigm that we have about how we engage with our audiences and our citizens about the, the work we create. But, but none of but, those things but are talking. But most of those meetings fall down when I talk to those companies and I say, that's fantastic, but if you're going to go out and talk to producers who have content and IP and clips and a whole range of ideas, they're going to say, what are you going to pay me? And at which point, quite a lot of the conversations stop because the companies say, well, we don't want to pay for it. We want it for nothing. I go, well, good luck. Very nice meeting. Good luck. I think Adam's bit about the bit in the middle is that technology has accelerated so much quicker than the traditional business model for funding high quality content. And unfortunately, we're in a position where, I just talked to John earlier on, is that we don't actually, or we're not being afforded any time by the internet stealers uh, to, to, to develop a new funding model that can replace existing ones. Uh, so money is being taken away from us now, and it's a runaway train. I mean, the, the extent of stuff that is being taken away is enormous. Well, let's just, can, you, can we quantify that at all? I mean, yeah, there is. There's, there's an article last week which is really interesting from Google. And if I said to everybody here that the chief engineer said that what they're going to do is they've now decided that if they get enough complaints uh, about the same site, then they're going to electronically move it down so that it's lower down in the uh, pages and doesn't come up on the first few pages. Um, and interestingly, he said uh, uh, that the article then asked how many uh, notices had they received to remove content, uh, and it was 4.3 million. Now, if, if, if I said that was for this year, you'd all go, that's a lot. It wasn't. That was for the month of July. And they now have more uh, notices for withdrawal of content at Google uh, in one day than they did in the entire 2009 year. And there were 30,000 so. illegal um, live streaming sh sites showing just the Premier League, which yeah. is the biggest, fastest growing section, is, li is um, live TV uh, piracy. But, but can you, in terms of impact on the industry, can you already say you're seeing things in your business that are being damaged by piracy? Yeah, I mean, uh, working on the distribution side, and I, I have been fortunate to work on both the channel sides and distribution. On distribution side now, we get broadcasters who come to us and, and they say we want to buy you know, the next Charlie Brooker shirt from us. And you kind of go, yeah, it'll be first in the territory. And then they come back and they go, well, actually, it isn't because it's all over these sites. Uh, you know, so therefore, we're going to have to reduce it because the impact of this show, especially with Charlie yeah. Brooker stuff, has, has, been, has been lost. So you're very clear. You're so, already so, losing a lot so, of revenue. Yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a clear example. When we, when we sold it in Italy, we lost money because it had been on the Ita Italian internet all over the place. And, and we lost, give or take, 20% of the normal licence fee, which okay. in, in, in return doesn't go back to Charlie Brooker, doesn't go back to, to, the, to the writers and, and, and producers. I mean, Rick, whether you like it or not, quite clearly there is a big threat that parts of this industry will be eroded and then there will not be people there to make the great content that people love to download. I mean, you, of, don't you of, have to acknowledge of, that? Of course there's a threat. That's the whole point. The internet is replacing the distribution model. I'd but like this to, is I'd about like money that's paid like to, to the people uh, who yeah, make like the programmes. Right, I'd like, to, I'd like to take an analogy here. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
Right. As for as let, let make his point. As for um, people not paying, I mean, I was paying subscriber number one hundred and ten out of twenty million to a service known, known as Pandora in the United States. It is like you say, when everything is ubiquitous, something else becomes valuable, and that is making making sense of all the things out there. Pandora is a music service where you enter a couple of tracks that you like, and it starts playing music that you like, but that you haven't heard of before. And that has value to me. So this is a service that I not only pay for, I also pay for circumvention to make it appear that I come from the United States, because stupid licensing rules only allows this service to operate in the United States. So this, this brings me to, when I hear people talking about rights and legitimate services, and legitimate services and innovation within the rights context, and gates and bars, I, I think of a UK law known as the Red Flag Act. When the uh, automobile was new, the, uh, in the UK there came laws that limited the automobile and its use in, in urban areas. It, the, the regulation said uh, every automobile must have a crew of three, it must have a driver, a stoker, as in a machinist, and a man walking before the car, waving a red flag, essentially limiting the car to walking speed in urban areas. It turned out later that this, this law was a result of lobbying from stagecoach and railroad industries, who tried to position themselves in the, in the view of seeing the car as something amazing for all of civilization, but only in as much as it didn't threaten their existing industries. And this is exactly where I see the framework of legitimate services, only in as much as it doesn't threaten the entire copyright framework, Crisis. which the, uh, essentially, entire younger generation is rejecting. Adam. I think that's right. I mean, I think that's, that's where the utopian idealism about the internet comes from, is that somehow this open system of networks will replace the old top-down system of elite distribution. And, you know, in one way, that's a very, very good argument. The problem with that argument is that it gives no clue as to what this is going to produce in the future, which is, gen no, let me finish, which right. is genuinely innovative. Because I do think that the problem, which is only just beginning to come into focus, is this idea of distributing things over networks is profoundly conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, because what you tend to do, Pandora is a very good example, what you tend to do is you tend to, if you allow people to connect with each other on networks, they tend to reinforce each other's opinions, beliefs, tastes, and everything like that. So what you tend to get in Pandora is, if you like this, people like you who are mm. uh, hipsters who live in Hoxton will like this. <laughs> and, and, and you become more like a hipster in Hoxton, and you all end up looking a bit varied, but all the same, if you know what I mean. But the whole world that, sounds like magic. And that's magic the phenomenon of our time, is that, <clears throat> is that what you're... What, and I think the internet, I mean, it's not only the internet, but the internet is sort of helping it. It's, it's, it's producing lots of groups which, who then chatter to each other on an open system, which is very good at distributing information, but it utterly fails at actually pushing forward into the future. And that's because... What the internet is, is an engineering system. It was built by engineers, and engineers have this mindset of keeping something stable. That's, what that's, that's their ideology, if there is one. And that's where we are trapped at the moment. And I don't think either of these arguments is really confronting the issue, which is how do you actually produce new things that people want to go and see, that genuinely are different, that take you into a different world, that, that allow you to grow up and stop being a hipster in Hoxton <laughs> and become something that the world hasn't seen yet, where's that going to come from? Who's going to push it and what it is? It's an exciting idea, but I think the internet sort of traps us because also sitting in this is this sort of fake idea of democracy that somehow mm -hmm. we can all chat to each other in Hoxton and somehow that's a democracy. But your argument uh, is much more that the potential damage is creative, not economic. No, my, no, my argument is that the damage of the internet is that it's a fundamentally conservative tool. Mm. And, it's whole, and both sides, mm. is what I'm saying, are holding the world back. Responding a bit to that argument, and tying back to what I just said, the Red Flag Act in the UK, as a result, gave Germany a head start of 30 years in the automotive industry versus Britain's automotive industry, which... Unfortunately, Britain never quite caught up with. So, 
regulation, especially when it comes from incumbent industries, can limit growth in dynamic and disruptive areas. You have a fantastic opportunity right here and right now to carve gold because people are spending as much on culture as they used to. Well, that's exactly what I want to come on to next. What do we do? You know, you are all never going to agree about whether or not it's the right thing, but you must all agree about the fact that it is happening, it's growing very fast, and the industry may well not have cottoned on to the size of the threat yet. So what to be done? Okay, uh, for, I wanted to address one point, <coughs> sort of being portrayed as the red flag me, carrier. British cars. Um, <coughs> what was wrong with British Leyland? Come on. Uh, <laughs> Jack, oh, you lost in Maxi. Uh, sorry, uh, it's showing my age there. Um, uh, I'd have a problem with the internet. In fact, I, I, I sort of technically agree with Adam. I think the internet's got some inherent problems with it. Uh, 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 I'd have a problem with it, what the internet is as a technology or as a, a network. I have a problem with what people do with it. People choose to be pirates. People choose to take things. People choose to set up exclusive VPN sites so you can break licensing arrangements. Uh, that's, think... that's a human behaviour. That's not a behaviour of the internet. That's human beings choosing to do that. But Therefore, those human beings are subject to the same laws as the rest of us. But do you think that people... It's not think... restricting the internet. But people, what? No, this is an important question. Do you think, think the millions of people who are downloading actually think they're breaking the law? If you look up something on Google that you're trying to find a live football match or something or whatever, no, you don't okay. necessarily no. think you're breaking the law. No, I don't think they do, but, but um, <coughs> uh, uh, I think there's a problem that, uh, as particularly in our, our, the UK economy, which is a very creative industries based economy, it's the fastest growing part of our economy, uh, we are world leaders in the creative industries, that is an IP based economy. I want my teenage boys to understand that if they write a song, they can copyright it and they can make money from that, from licensing it and getting MCPS and PRS royalties. But your As I did when I was 17 year old and wrote a song with three chords and got a John Peel session. So, so, so I, want, I want the next generation to be as au fait with IP and copyright, even more so because they have a global market. So that's the way they can make money. Uh, that's, how, that, that's part of the solution going forward is we've got to move people away from somehow the internet is all about free and the spurious nonsense of free to actually the internet is a fantastic opportunity for our creative industries to make money and whether you're 52 like me or 16 year old like my kid who's making money from Minecraft uh, that's the opportunity it brings you. I just have to ask if your sons ever illegally download anything. Do you ask them? They wouldn't check? dare. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's the solution for you? Um, well, I mean, lots of things have been banded around, uh, you know, obviously Windows as well, uh, where we window in content uh, and getting it uh, to the users quicker. Um, I, I, the trouble is, it is, it is like everything, you know, the majority of people want to stay legal. It's a small minority who want to flout the rules, and, and that's where the wrong bit is going. And, and in the UK, where they're trying to put in legislation where you, if you get caught, downloading uh, a particular site on many occasions, you will have your internet slowed down or whatever, and you have to appeal and pay 20 quid. Well, actually, that's probably the wrong way around. It's the people who are putting it up. It's not the people who are using it, because the end users, you're quite right, probably are ignorant that they don't realise that they are breaking a law and they are stealing. Uh, and it is educating, as, as John's intimated, we've got to educate the public that, you know, if you want to watch quality content, there is a cost and somebody has to pay for it. And, 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 and I think the other thing is as well, the one that I also hate is everybody keeps on saying about the fat cats of, of, of the studios in the States. Um, there are none of those fat cats sitting out here. These Just are filled with independent people who've mortgaged their houses to make creative yeah. content. And if I don't go out and distribute it uh, and charge uh, companies for it, I can't flow the royalties back for them to pay off their mortgages before they go bankrupt. Whether you'd like it or not, in a sense, is it ever going to be realistic to try to stop this happening? I mean, isn't this partly just about the real reluctance to give up the power that you have had for a long time? Well, I, I, I don't. I don't. Th I think that we, we. Everyone tries to be progressive, and I, I hate to be ever labelled as a dinosaur and not moving on with the I times. I call you a dinosaur. Uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I do. I do think there is. There is absolutely. We need to find a solution. And as I say, is it Windows or not? But at the moment, we're not being given the opportunity from the other side to find that solution because it's carrying on in front of our very noses where it is being taken and value is being taken out before we can sit down and work it out as to what we should do to fix this problem. It's not going to be fixed overnight. 
Adam, I'm fascinated to see what you've made of what we've just heard, because you've written a lot and made a lot of films about the relationships about power and looked at the relationships between people who have a lot of power and people who don't. And here, as these guys are saying, perhaps, as I we've been discussing... Yeah. I don't really think this is a fundamental challenge to power. I mean, I do think yeah. it's a bit rich when independent television company go on about how poor they are. I mean, <laughs> I mean you know... The, the, I mean, I think... How, What's I'm always more? shocked by... I mean, I'm not talking just about you. I'm talking that, that, that they all whinge about it, and, but actually they make a vast amount of money. And I think drama is... The, the, the amount of money spent on making dramas is, is absolutely astounding. They, a lot of this could come down, but that's, a, that's beside the point. The, the real issue I'm talking about is you may meet, have all your Beatles meetings, but all these people come along and talk about techie dweeb stuff about new networks and all that stuff. What I can't see emerging on the internet is genuinely new content which is of the internet, and you couldn't put on television. And I think it will, I mean, the internet's not going to go away. It will happen. It's just that it's dominated by geeks at the moment, and they just don't let... <laughs> uh, gen I mean, they built the thing, and that's brilliant. It's a brilliant piece of engineering. But they are imposing this sort of web ideology on it, which is all about interactivity and let's, let's, let's Pandora-rise each other. And, 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 it, and it's terribly conservative. It's holding stuff back. And the answer is, is new stuff is going to come in that people will want to put on the internet that they can charge for if they want or they don't have to. It's up to them. And they will be in the control of it. Um, you know, and, and people, Endemol will have to start mortgaging their houses. Um, and, and it, it, but those things haven't emerged yet. Nothing, I haven't seen anything new on any of your Beatles meetings, people's stuff. Uh, yeah, it's I'm all about, oh, yeah. we can allow people to watch sports in this way or that way. It's just a technical thing about how you disperse already existing, not new, stuff. New stuff hasn't emerged. New stuff will emerge, and that will give, have a mystique to it, a power to it, and people will want to, if it's good, people will want to pay for it. It's like journalism. The reason a lot of newspapers are failing at the moment because of the, it's not really because the internet is taking away from me, it's because their journalism is so boring at the moment, because they quite obviously don't know what's going on. Rick. Right. At the end of this session, we had a video showing that there were new anti-piracy laws being proposed, but that massive citizen rallies bordering on uprisings made politicians back down in horror, not understanding what was going on. And I'd, I'd just like to elevate to that level a little bit. Why are people rallying? As in, why are there, there are hundreds of thousands of people out in the streets of Europe for the right to watch things for free? Well, that's, that's the disconnect here. It is not about watching things for free. It is not about that. It is about what you need to impose to prevent people from watching things for free. Because as soon as you have a digital communication channel, as soon as I call somebody, I have a digital communication channel, I chat with somebody, I am on a website, I can use that digital communications channel to talk in private, to talk to my lawyer, or to communicate copyrighted works of art. And the only way to tell which is which is to listen to all of it. So you have a fundamental conflict between enforcing copyright and the right to communicate in private as a concept. And the young people of Europe understand that, and that is why they are rallying in the hundreds of thousands on the streets of Europe for freedom of speech when there's a new anti-piracy law being proposed. And that's the fundamental conflict here. And as a politician, I have to rise to this and see, okay, so here's what's being lost. But at the end of the day, no entrepreneur gets to dismantle civil liberties, even if they can't make money otherwise. But for most, so, but, so, but for, for most young people who were upset about new piracy laws, was it really about a point of philosophy, or was it really the idea that they might have to pay for some music that they have it's to It's definitely pay about the net. People don't care about money. I mean, you see pirates, you see pirates happily paying for things that they like. You, you see that all the time. Like me paying for Pandora, you can see it in, in yeah, the mean, studies, this, this is studies very, too. Is, it is it's about, it's it's about this, fundamental... No, no, this is a very interesting area, uh, which we, because television has become rather so devalued. It's all about value. I mean, uh, 
I also think that most people are actually protesting in Europe because of the cuts and the austerity measures and the Eurozone crisis. And I think that's really <laughs> the, the big issue of our time, Not the which the internet rallies. really isn't really de dealing with. Um, but I do think, and this is interesting, if something has a mystique, people actually do want to pay for it. It's, it's a really peculiar thing about human nature. What I'm trying to say is that because everything has become so ubiquitous and is all the rather the same, because television is very the same at the moment, it, 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 it loses that mystique and therefore it feels free. It feels that it should be free because it's lost something. And it's lost something partly because of technology, partly because of loss of confidence in the, within the programme makers and the schedulers and, 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 and all the associated PR people around them. If people actually create something that genuinely is special and new, actually paying for it, people like it. I mean, you are right in that way. I haven't seen anyone actually do that yet on the internet, but, but I think that might happen. John, what do you say to that point? I mean, actually, if there were people in this room at this conference making better, newer, exciting, more innovative stuff, people wouldn't buy it. Uh, no, I think some people would still buy it anyway, but I, I, mean, I, I mean, I take Adam's point. I mean, I think that, but well, that's do part... You, do you accept that? That if you make something yeah. that, that, that would satisfy what Adam wants, that people wouldn't pirate. Well, I don't know, because clearly we've not seen it yet. But, I mean, I think... I think When's I, your next series out? Maybe this is the answer <laughs> that we're all waiting for. Uh, no, I, mean, I, I think it's about, for me, it's about education. I mean, I, mean, I take the point about civil liberties, but none of the... I mean, the, we have the Digital Economy Act in the UK. You know, many people protested about that when it went through Parliament. It's about two. Three. <laughs> three people, uh, because it wasn't seen as an attack on civil liberties or freedom of speech. That's not how it was. And it isn't an attack on civil liberties or freedom of speech. It is a way to try and address illicit, egregious copyright theft, uh, 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 as, as it's seen. But I'd rather we never had to send a letter to anyone. I'd rather we had a citizenry and young people who recognised that if they were making the thing that Adam so desires, that they would have copyright in it. They could monetize it. They could earn a living. They could have a career. They could go on to become fantastically successful creative people and win the next version of BAFTAs, whatever they are. That, I'd much rather that's how we looked at our creative economy. Uh, and, and it's not an attack on civil liberties. It's actually trying to encourage more creativity. And I agree with Adam on this. Uh, but if you're going to encourage people to be creative, I don't go along with the romantic Victorian starving in a garret. I think that is patent nonsense and has been, always has been. I think if you're a creative, you should be rewarded for your endeavours and if you can make a living and you can pay your mortgage and feed your kids and pay the, 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 the uh, Tesco bill, that's fine, what's wrong with that? that that's, that's legitimate. Okay. And I don't, see why, I don't see why how us questioning about what people do on the internet is an attack on civil liberties. Okay, well let's just open it up to the floor now. We've touched on a lot of very big different issues, but what we haven't talked about very much is maybe the practicalities of how we might actually deal with this problem. But anyway, question to the gentleman there. I think there are some roving mics. And if you can tell us your name, please, and who you work for. Hi, Josh Halliday from The Guardian. Um, I'm interested in what you think about the current methods of tackling online piracy, especially in the UK. Um, there was the case of Anton Vickerman, the guy who ran Surf the Channel file sharing website last month, uh, sentenced to four years in prison um, for conspiracy to defraud. Um, he was, the CPS said they weren't interested in him. Um, fact, the Federation Against Copyright uh, Theft took a private prosecution against him, hired private investigator, investigators to go into his home, take photographs of his computers, and then pass all his evidence to the police. Is that, a, is that the right way to tackle this? Mark, do you approve of private prosecutions and people being put in jail for piracy? Well, there was a frustration, I think, because at the end of the day, this guy <coughs> was stealing stuff. He was making £35,000 a month from the proceeds, of, uh, and he was taking it all. He was trying to sell his website as well as a going concern for £400,000. Um, look, you know, whoever was trying to, to, to uh, track this down, the police didn't want to know, so they took it in their own hands. So. It seems all a bit extreme using, using those methods, and I don't know why we have to go down that route to, to use those methods, but clearly the guy was benefiting off other people's hard work and stealing stuff. That can't be right. And that can't be right. As a general principle, though, do you think that the industry might have to, and would you support a pattern where there were increasing numbers of private prosecutions? Look, if, if you can't get it done uh, you know, through the police and they're overstretched and, and, and you have to go down those routes, that's fine. But in terms of breaking in and stealing things, I, 
I can't possibly condone that. Of course, I couldn't. OK, Rick, if we get into a pattern of sending people to jail in this country for this stuff, what do you think the impact would be? I think, I think history is going to be very harsh on you. I mean, if you look at Anton Vickerman and Surf the Channel, when you look at, first of all, you shouldn't have a private police force. That, that's antithetical to anything that, that uh, a democracy stands for. We don't have it was a, it was not a private force. prosecution and they Sorry, hired an yeah. It wasn't a private police force, just to be clear well, about the kind well, of enough. case it was. Fair enough. It's a we special case in the UK yet. where you allow an industry <laughs> branch <laughs> to bring a criminal prosecution case. That, that's fairly unique in the Western world. And this guy had links. Links cannot be illegal in, un, under any circumstance, in the uh, way I see it. And it, it brings additional questions that fact, in this case, which brought the prosecution, their, their board members had financial interests in a competing site, which essentially had the exact same content. So Surf the Channel didn't have any infringing content on it, none whatsoever, and they still managed to find a judge sympathetic to their case and essentially ruin a young guy's life. But it's, it, and that, I think that's what, absolutely horrible. Whatever the particulars of, of this case, and we do have an you know, independent judiciary, even though it was a private prosecution, <clears throat> if there becomes a pattern where people go to jail for this stuff, do you think the UK might be disadvantaged against other countries? Absolutely, because well, what will happen is that you'll, you'll kill innovation. The, the, these distribution models are dead. The copyright model of locking up content and having an elite publishing gatekeeper is dead, it, and it is not coming back. The sooner something replaces it, or something else will replace it, the, the sooner you hit the magic recipe, the, the sooner you'll carve gold. The next generation will replace these values, will use its values to replace yes, this legislation. Adam, okay, the elite model may be dead, but what I find so odd is that the actual people who own the systems around which this non-elite model is distributed are po possibly the most consolidated and concentrated pieces of power in the Western world since, oh, peace, yeah. since the robber baron era. I mean, I'm talking about people like Apple, mm -hmm. you know, the most richest company in the I world. I agree with that. that, that I, mean, that I do think itself. there is something rather weird in this <coughs> pro anti-elitist sort of new kind of democracy distribution thing when in fact actually it's all over systems owned by a tiny few totally unaccountable um, very powerful groups on the west coast of America mainly. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean th that's it and also I do find it very odd that we all look at them on exactly the same object the iPhone which is, that doesn't seem to be about innovation and variety very much, but there you go. And you said there were robber barons you described them as. No, I was talking about the, the last period where you had the most recent concentration of power, of information, in America, because we live in an American world, was in the 1890s in the robber baron era, and they were totally unaccountable. They had as much control of politicians as the, the telecommunication systems. Under Clinton, that lot, Apple, all the other lot, got hold of politics in America, and they can, they, they, their lobbyists are really, really, really powerful. And I just think it's, it's one of the most unexamined er areas in this internet utopianism. Is that you're talking about three or four vast systems, uh, companies, owning these systems, over which all this so-called democracy is going. It's very weird. I don't buy it. Thank you. Next question, please. At the back there. Um, Adam, I, oh, microphone, thank you. Um, I'm interested, uh, the thing that surprises me that you said, Adam, is about stuff being boring these days. And I just, stuff, having seen a, a pitching um, uh, forum earlier, I'd say that's a very uh, jaded TV way of expressing oneself about, I've seen that before, this is boring. I just, my, my feeling is that um, uh, in the, it feels like to, to see, you know, it, uh, it's all storytelling. We're talking uh, in terms of content. Um, we're, we're comparing different forms of storytelling. And that very exciting storytelling for me was coming in this, out of the cinema in the 1970s. And that in the last four or five years particularly, it seems to be a very exciting time in television, particularly American television. Um, and I'm, I'm just surprised by your comments about things being not very interesting these days. And that a lot of what, uh, what's driving the bit torrents, the, the, the piracy is our appetite to see these exciting TV shows that we've heard about that are on in America and aren't 
on here yet. I just, I'm just wary of the, the jadedness of the idea that there isn't um, good what? stuff on it. Anymore. Sorry, can what you just tell us your, your name and wh where you're from, please? Uh, my name is Andy Griffin, and my company's called Pirate Productions, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> no so relation. No <laughs> to, be, to, to be fair to myself, um, uh, what I, we all have to be, What right? I was actually just saying is boring these days is modern daily journalism. Uh, it, I'm talking about television as well as printed web. I think one of the reasons why that is dying so much is, is partly because of the internet, but as much because it has run out of confidence and esteem, and it's, it's very boring. That's what I was referring to. I also think in modern music, whilst there is a lot of very good stuff, it's tending to go round and round and round, constantly replaying old bits from the past and reworking them in new collages, sometimes very excitingly, but it's, it's got this sense of stuckness. I think you're right about some of that drama. I think things like Breaking Bad are really, 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 really innovative. Uh, I love Game of Thrones. I think Game of Thrones is absolutely wonderful, and I think actually is about epic struggles for power, and, and is how we should look at things like Apple, and we should do Game of Thrones about all that, and the Eurozone should be portrayed like that. But my point is, is that actually, you, you are simply using the internet to distribute that. What I'm saying is that the internet hasn't actually produced thrilling new stuff that you wouldn't put on television, that genuinely is amazingly new, that I, I don't know, just a 200-hour thing that you just want to have. I don't know, it, it just doesn't seem to be coming at the moment. It seems to be just a technology. So that's, maybe that's all it's going to, going to be, I don't know. But, but mm -hmm. So that was my point. And the boringness is no daily journalism. I just think it's... it's, it's um, can I just, and I would say this, wouldn't I, but can I just pick you up on that point, particularly about TV daily journalism? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I can see someone from the press department where I work. I'm slightly nervous now. Um, if it's the case that it's dead and boring, and that's a very big and complicated debate, how do you explain then that news audiences have actually held up surprisingly, extremely well, or in a pretty decent state? Because they haven't got anything else. Um, <gasps> <laughs> it's boring because basically the way we report the world, in, in two ways, doesn't connect with the way we as viewers experience the world. There's, there's, we, they've moved away. And secondly, it's been captured by policy wonks and all those think tank people that encircle power in Westminster and encircle studios. They feed those um, men and women into the studios day by day and they talk economic language which we don't understand, doesn't relate to our experience and we know doesn't really connect with what's going on in the world. For example, the Eurozone crisis is they talk about overnight bank offer offerings and then I just drift away. Whereas actually what's going on in Europe, for example, is a Game of Thrones. I mean, it's massive. That there are, you know, struggle, greed, power, lust, money. It's, but we don't portray it like that. We have people from the Institute of Economic Affairs come on our 24-hour news channels and talk endlessly about how the rates for uh, Santander Bank borrowing money has spiked surprisingly today at 12%, which means there's going to be another crisis. And I just think, well, where's the crisis? And B, you're boring. <laughs> you must watch how so that's your answer. I mean, that's what I think. <laughs> anyway. And I think I'm not alone. But okay, uh, just to pick you up oh. on your point about that you haven't seen anything new on coming through the internet, is that not specifically because the funding isn't there? I mean, I went to a session yesterday when we were talking about SBTV and, and we we're talking about Fleur. Uh, these guys, you know, the, they, have a, they have a good following uh, and they're there to make money and, and they do it through YouTube. Uh, but, you know, they start out with a £300 cannon and they're shooting it there in the bedroom. You know, Game of Thrones is 3.2 million quid to make. That's the difference. I, you know, now, but you need money you for want, a good If you want idea. to get into content on the internet, surely you're going to have to find some money to do it because a Canon camera in your bedroom isn't going to cut it. No, I'm talking about new ways of telling stories that are thrilling, and that can be done for 300 pounds or, I mean, so, yes, of course, you can probably do it better for 3.2 million pounds. But I, what I haven't seen, and the internet has been going what's properly since about 1998 as a way of looking at stuff. I haven't seen genuinely anything thrillingly different that you wouldn't put on television on the internet beyond about three minutes. I mean, mm. there have been three minute, you know, things falling over downstairs and sneezing pandas. Mm. And, yeah. and that's great. I love all that. I mean, I love all this stuff. It's, it's fantastic. But there isn't genuinely something. I mean, like someone talked about in film movies in the 1970s, genuinely came out and had a completely new language totally new way of telling stories. They jumped around in time and they were absolutely thrilling to people. And we still live with the residue of that. If you look at a lot of mainstream Hollywood movies, the, the jumps they make, which of course we don't, still don't do in drama here, 
come out of that thrilling avant-gardism that you had in the 1970s in American cinema. None of that thrilling avant-gardism has emerged on the internet. It seems to me it's a technical system of transmission still at the moment, and no one's genuinely... And you can do that for £300. Mm. Those, those early avant-gardists in the America did it on shoestring. OK, all right. We've probably got time for one or maybe two more questions. So any hands up in the audience? Yes, uh, the gentleman there, please. And if you, again, if you can say where you're from. Uh, um, my name's Justin Judd. I work a lot with Hulu in the US, which was a company established principally as a response to uh, piracy of TV content. Um, and while I don't speak on their behalf, <coughs> the learning from them was that if you make stuff available in a timely fashion, people will consume it through legal channels. So the thing I, I think I've heard this afternoon that I have the most trouble with is what Mark said, which is, you know, if I'm in Italy and I want to watch Game of Thrones in the middle of summer, that's what I'm going to do, whether you provide it for me legally or illegally. And the response has to be, do you have to make your content available to your users when they want it, not when you want to give it to them. And I completely appreciate the point about you know, there needs to be a, a value capture mechanism, but if you don't make it available when they want it, then you forego the ability to capture any value out of it. The other point to make here is that you know, the sums involved may be less than you're used to, but that is a phenomenon of, of, of everything that is happening in the digital space. The, kind of, you know, the, the so-called 10 to 1 rule, whereas you would get $1 before, now you get 10 cents. And that's the kind of fact we're all going to have to live with as creators, and I speak as an ex-producer as well. So I, I think that the response, and there needs to be one, and it needs to be a legal response, it has to be around making stuff available in a timely fashion so that people, when they want it, they can consume it legally, uh, because if they don't, then they will find it illegally. And there's a very good cartoon, actually, that relates to Game of Thrones on a website called theoatmeal.com, which I would urge everyone to look at, about a, 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 it's a, it's a kind of four or five panel drawing about a guy who decides, you know, having finished reading the Game of Thrones books, he wants to watch it, he goes looking for it legally, he goes via Amazon, he goes to all these different places, iTunes, Hulu even, he can't find it anywhere, so what does he do? He ends up watching it illegally, and it encapsulates precisely the behavior of people. Uh, and I kind of buy into the notion that social value has now moved ahead of the law and ahead of, uh, and the technology has moved ahead of the law, and the response has to be about timeliness of availability. I, I don't disagree, and I think that Hulu and Love Film, um, uh, you know, uh, are, are antidotes towards piracy. Um, just before we get too carried away on that, you know, Game of Thrones, when it's transmitted in the US, gets more illegal downloads on the same day it's transmitted as it does on the actual station. So, but you know, I mean, it, that's timely and it's in the same ter territory. So, is it still that culture that you, you have to pay for? <laughs> But in any other business, Mark, if you built a shop and people stopped going to that shop because they were all going to the other shop in the other town, mm. you wouldn't keep your shop open in that no, town, you'd open be. it in the other one. So isn't it the same principle? You actually, the opportunity is for you guys put the content where people want it and when they want it, and anything else is just... I, 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 and I don't think century. I've said anything this afternoon that doesn't say that that's, that's probably the route to go. What I've said is that we haven't been given the space or the time in order to change our business models so that we can deliver it quicker. Is there any chance that you and are, your... Are you arguing that... Are people should give them time? Uh, I'm, give I'm them sorry, time to do I'm it? sorry if this sounds sarcastic, but I hear you arguing that the world should, should wait for you to catch up with it. No, in, in terms of a business model, because uh, yeah, if we want quality drama like Game of Thrones, which keeps on being mentioned, that costs real money. It doesn't cost £300, it costs the £3 million. So we've got to find that money, and if it gets illegally pirated, that money doesn't flow back in, and therefore those Games of Thrones will start to dry up. Well, in terms of HBO, they have a completely different business model. They have, they have yes. a subscription business model, so that they don't have a problem with piracy as such, since, since they are dependent on, on uh, fixed subscribers to their ca cable channel. But the thing is, all of this has happened before. We are essentially just sitting here rehashing a discussion that took place in this place about 160 years ago when in 1849, the UK discussed a law making pu public libraries. And the publishers, book publishers of the time, went absolutely ballistic, saying that 
You can't allow anybody to read any book for free. Are you out of your minds? Nobody will ever be able to make a living from writing books again. No book will ever be written again if you pass this law. Previously, the publishers had tried to outlaw lending books from private individual to private individual. Everybody should buy their own copy. But Parliament, British Parliament passed this law and the first public library did open in 1850. And as we know, no books have indeed been written ever since. <laughs> well, there are of course all sorts of issues as well about Amazon and what that's done to that whole industry in recent years, but I think we must leave it there. We've touched on some really fascinating areas in what I think is going to be a debate that gets louder and louder. I feel a bit like we've scratched the surface, but thank you very much indeed for your questions. And will you join with me in thanking the panel very much indeed for their time this afternoon.